Good morning, and welcome to the Museum of the San Ramon Valley's virtual speaker series. My name is Dan Dunn, and I'm the director of the museum. Today is the sixth presentation in this series. Past presentations have included Highway 21, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, California's first people, then and now, and last month, our tour of the Alamo Pioneer Cemetery. Our presentation today takes us from the Comstock Lode to the Bay Area. You know the tower, you know the Cliff House, and you know the bath ruins. Today we get to hear the story of Adolf Sutro, Diana Conkey, Instruction and Outreach Librarian of Sutro Library, will tell us Sutro's fascinating story from German immigrant to Comstock Lode riches to San Francisco politician and philanthropist and show us the library that he founded. We have a good guide for today. Diana Conkey has worked in special collections and archives in San Francisco since 2006. Her educational background is an MLIS as well as an MA in American history. She's passionate about primary sources as a way to reach out to communities and students in order to engage critical thinking and develop research skills. As I mentioned, she's the out outreach and instructional librarian for Sutro Library and has been with the library for close to nine years. She's in charge of curating exhibits for the Sutro as well as the Sutro Library's Twitter and Instagram. Please use the chat window this, this morning at the bottom of the screen for any questions that you have. Feel free to send in questions anytime during the presentation and we'll address them at the end. And now to our presentation. It's my great pleasure to introduce Diana Conkey. Diana? Hi, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, I am here to tell you about a really special library. It is a hidden treasure that people hardly know about, and I'm hoping to change that. Um, so the library is almost uh, exclusively known today as a genealogy library. And um, that's sort of obscured the special collections that Sutro actually had collected and intended to be a public research library for the citizens of San Francisco. Um, I didn't even know this library existed until I interviewed for the job and I got a letter in the mail asking if I was interested in interviewing. And I discovered this amazing collection and I'm so happy to be able to share its story and the story of Adolf Sutro because it's a really fascinating story. So today we're on the campus of San Francisco State University, finally, it's our first permanent home. Um, and the story of Sutro is an interesting one and in how we get, got to this place. Sutro once said, I don't believe in aristocracy. The aristocracy of the mind is the only aristocracy I recognize. It makes no difference to me whether a man has got a cent or not a cent or whether he is a millionaire. So it, I think this provides a lot of insight into who Sutro was. Uh, the library, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him and his history and the history of the library. Uh, I think that this, this story is a part of the social and cultural fabric of San Francisco, and the library that Sutro collected is just one of his many legacies. It's largely been obscured by circumstance, by one, never having a permanent home until 2012, and two, the genealogy collection, which took up uh, staff and resources and really left the, the special archives and collections and rare books unattended for the most part. So Sutro has been left out of this larger narrative of great research libraries and collections like the Bancroft and the Huntington, both collecting at the same time as Sutro in California. And our collections are as rich and rare, which I will show you today. So historians have said that it's quite possible in the annals of American book collecting and library history no collector has received less recognition in relation to the value and importance of his library than San Francisco entrepreneur Adolf Sutro. And Sutro wore many hats. 
he was once a mayor. Um, oh, hold on. I have to get this. Yeah. Yes, if you could advance slides. Yeah, I'm having, yeah, I need to get that up. Okay, oh, sorry. Sorry, everybody. I thought there might be technical difficulties. Okay. So uh, Sutro wore many hats. He was at once San Francisco mayor from 1895 to 1897. He was an engineer, an entrepreneur, and philanthropist. And like many German Jewish immigrants, decided to make San Francisco his permanent home. He wanted to use his wealth to make San Francisco a modern city. And to that end, he wanted to build a world-renowned public research library. Kevin Starr, California State, once California State Librarian and Historian, said that in San Francisco's early years, it experienced instant urbanism. The population explosion saw 60% of all of California's population in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's 60%. Yet it was still described as having a rapid, monstrous maturity. And as late as 1882, on a trip to the city, Oscar Wilde described it as having a ramshackle frontier quality. It's within this framework, Sutro can be seen as intentionally investing in the next phase of San Francisco's development. Unfortunately, Sutro never got around to building the structure for the collection. It sat in limbo while his heirs decided what to do for several years um, after his death. And in 1906, while it was stored downtown in two different locations, the 1906 earthquake happened and what was most known was the fire that followed. That probably destroyed a two thirds of Sutra's original collection. Unfortunately, we're not exactly sure, but current newspaper accounts had said that his collection had gotten up to about 300 to 500,000 volumes. And after the fire, only 125,000 rare books, also antiquarian maps and archival collections remain. We are still adding to the library, however, and one of the things that we've done, thanks uh, to the new director, Maddie Tarmina, is that we tried to fill in gaps um, in the research collection. As Sutra died in 1898, all of those collections are prior to then for the most part. And so we're filling in gaps like in women's history. So we've actually collected materials from several different of the women's marches held in California, and we have the largest collection of 2017 Women's March materials in the state. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, many of them have been digitized. And then just to give you an idea, I found this, um, this, this little piece in one of the older newspapers, Contemporary, talking about just how amazing this library was. And here, the professor of Cornell writes, Sutra Library is, I think, beyond comparison, the best collection in America both as to numbers and to the quality of the books of the 15th century. And I gravely doubt if it has any rival this side of the Atlantic for its literature of the 16th century in travels of every age, in church history, canon law and theology, in the history of all of the sciences, especially the natural sciences, in curias of many sorts, its shelves are a, go a Golconda of treasures. And it's, it's true. And even though a lot of the, the collection was lost, it still has amazing things. So let's take a look at Sutro and his life and how we ended up with this great library here in the city of San Francisco and in California that is available for everyone. So when we look at Sutro's life, we can get a sense of the immense changes that are taking place causing disruptions in all facets of life. The industrial revolution and wars were causing mass migration, fundamentally altering the world. Steamboats, also a part of this revolution in transportation, were also a major driver of increased globalization and making trade and travel easier than ever before as ships no longer had to rely on the wind. So Sutra was born into this time and he's born Adolf Heinrich, Joseph Sutro, April 29, 1830, in the ancient city of Aachen, Germany. At the time, it was Prussia, which is part of modern day uh, Germany and was a loosely affiliated state. So Sutro came from a largely secular Jewish family. He was the third of 11 children. 
The family owned a cloth making factory, which Sutro worked at and then ran after the death of his father. From an early age, Sutro loved books and learning. One biography says his love of books was taught to him by his father with a bent towards science and engineering. Other historians have said he actually used his allowance as a young boy to buy books, which I love. Um, and even though he lacked a formal education, Sutra was passionate about pursuing knowledge and was proficient in several languages, including Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. And the city to which he was born um, has been around since Neolithic times and settlements have been there. It was also a, an important seat of power in the Holy Roman Empire a culturally and intellectually rich city and a place that was a resort town with some of the early Roman baths being built here. And it's still known for that today. However, we look at why Sutro and his family would have chosen to leave. So historians talk about push and pull in mass migration. And in the 19th century, Prussia was experiencing revolutions that forced mass migration. That, coupled with increasing anti-Semitism, easing immigration restrictions, forced many out, like Sutro's family, and were a wave of immigrants leaving um, in this time. Sutro's family entered through New York, and they were on this boat that they traveled from Antwerp, Belgium, to New York City. And this is a passenger list um, showing they arrived up here in 1849. And then you see here's Sutro's mother. And then here's Sutro right here, age 20 years old. And here it has what the family was taking, 38 packages containing clothing, bedding, and furniture. And I don't know what that says. So if anyone's able to read that, I'd love to know. But um, then you can see all of his family. So Sutro would have arrived in New York City um, seeing men trolling the docks, talking about stories of golden riches to be found in California. So Sutro, most of his family settled in Baltimore, but Sutro, like many young men at the time, decided that he was going to go to California and see what was up with the gold rush. So he was drawn, obviously, by opportunities by the gold rush, but not necessarily in mining. So the only ways to get to San Francisco from the East Coast um, were overland or across the Isthmus of Panama or around the Cape. The Isthmus of Panama was the, the quickest route, but all of these uh, methods were really dangerous. Um, so Sucho decided he was gonna cross the Isthmus of Panama and it took him many days to get across. Um, the gold rush, led to this migration and he was not alone. Um, so some of the things that he would have experienced are people getting yellow fever, problems with getting food, dysentery. There was just a lot of things that were a danger in crossing the isthmus, but he was a young man and determined to make his way. Um, and this is just an illustration showing what it was like he had to take mules and boats to get across the isthmus. And then once on the other side, you would catch a mail ship or a steamship to California. And so this is actually the ship on which Sutro traveled. Uh, the California was one of the first of three ships that were specified in a government mail contract that was to provide mail, passenger and freight service from Panama to San Francisco and to Oregon. So when Sutro arrived, he would have seen this kind of scene. Uh, men who came uh, seeking gold and going to the gold fields would often abandon whatever uh, ship they came on and just head inland to the gold fields. And then some innovative people would convert it into a hotel or other business. But this is what it looked like. It was uh, early stages. And so Sutro decided in his first years that he was going to engage in some businesses. And he finally made some success in as being a tobacconist. And this is an ad um, from 1853. Um, I think this is in one of the Stockton newspapers, but he advertised in Stockton and in San Francisco and did pretty well. However, in 1863, the Comstock load made headlines. And here is one of the first mentions um, of 
of this discovery, but it just says there's a sensation in Virginia City about a rich, a discovery of rich ledges. So Sutro, like others, would have seen this, and he decided he was going to sell his three tobacco stores and left his wife and three children in San Francisco and headed to the Comstock. His first business was opening a refining mill to extract silver quartz called the Sutro Metallurgical Works, which did yield a modest profit. However, for years, Sutro had been working on a grander idea, and he finally began to execute it. A four-mile tunnel, 1,500 feet below ground, through the Comstock load to drain water and to ventilate the many mines, allowing silver to be extracted and permitting miners to bring out this rich silver ore. Um, this is in, the 18, in 1866, and this is the first mention uh, in writing that I found of Sutro's intent on the tunnel where he is getting land put aside for this uh, tunnel that he plans on making. And here are all the mining claims on the Comstock, which he was hoping to make money off of with his tunnel. Uh, this is one of the reports that he wrote and that was presented to uh, Congress uh, to convince them to help uh, fund this venture and saying that it was in the national security interests. Um, so Mark Twain actually met and became friends with Adolf Sutro in Virginia City. And um, this friendship this actually, this this quote comes from a uh, forward in one of his books, but it talks about Sutro and his tunnel. And he says, through the Comstock load from end to end at a depth of 2,000 feet, Mr. Sutro, the originator of this prodigious enterprise, is one of the few men in the world who is gifted with the pluck and perseverance necessarily, necessary to follow up and hound such an undertaking to its completion. He's converted several obstinate Congresses to a deserved friendliness towards his important work and has gone up and down to and fro in Europe until he has enlisted a great moneyed interest there. So Sutro spent 15 years working on this project, lobbying Congress, convincing the miners as well as the state of California to back him, gain financing from European sources at the same time as fighting William Ralston and the Bank of California, which wanted to get in on the riches and every step of the way tried to derail Sutro. Nevertheless, the tunnel was finished in 1878 and in 1879, Sutro sold shares in his tunnel and came back to San Francisco, a multimillionaire. Shortly, unfortunately, shortly thereafter, the mines dried up and the tunnel was basically useless. But again, it took 15 years of his life to realize, probably cost him his marriage, and definitely time with his children and constant stress. So Sutro came back to San Francisco, deciding to make this his permanent home, and, and to that end, wanted to make it a sophisticated urban center. He wanted to use the riches that he had made from the Comstock to buying books for this library and into real estate, as well as into performing works of charity and philanthropy. Um, he eventually, so there's been some dispute over how much land in the city of San Francisco that Sutro owned. Some people said it was a 12th of all the real property. Um, this article um, says it was an eighth. Let's just say he owned most of San Francisco. Um, so he, bought 22 acres of uh, what was to become Sutro Heights, his home out above the cliff house. These are the gates. And he would allow people on Wednesdays and Saturdays to use the Sutro Heights as a park. And this is his pretty modest dwelling in 1886. And Sutro on his horse, like a Victorian gentleman, I guess should be. Um, this is a parapet, and I'm not sure why that cannon is there or um, how long it even stayed there, but maybe some of you know. And there's the parapet from Sutra Heights overlooking the Cliff House. And Sutra purchased the Cliff House in 1893, but never made much of a profit. So Sutra also started Ar Arbor Day, and 
I found this really fun and charming article by the poet Joaquin Miller, who talks about him and Sutro sort of coming up with Arbor Day for San Francisco. And he says in this article, visiting my dear old friend of other days, Adolf Sutro, he asked me to plant a tree, an old custom in Europe. Finding he had planted millions of trees and had trees to give to all who would plant, the idea of an Arbor Day, already in the air perhaps, began to take solid form. The call took up the matter and kept it up month after month. The women took it up, such women as Mrs. John Vance Cheney, Mrs. Har Wagner, Miss Coolbreath, and so on. And so this is a scene described of this first Arbor Day. And it just describes the 40,000 trees that were given to school children to plant and that Yerba Island was chosen. And the idea, I, I just love this whole description. The idea took and spread like a forest fire. General Howard came forward with men. The Secretary of the Navy sent ships. Sutro inspected the island, found the soil rich and deep. Ex-Governor Perkins set the day, the 28th of November, and a day it was indeed. Who can forget the scene? The ships, the booming guns, the thousands and thousands of happy school children, Sutro planting the first tree, dear old General Vallejo on horseback, making his speech in Spanish, his very last speech and last public appearance, senators, governors, officers in glittering uniforms, a thousand pretty women, and General Old General Howard, gentle old General Howard, carrying water up the hill all day with his one arm to water the children's trees. And I just love this description and also this, this moment of General Vallejo and his last appearance, just it makes you think of this California that's tr really transitioning and becoming something different. Um, so I just, I, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. So Sutro also uh, built the Sutro Bass, which um, he opened in 1896. Um, this massive glass instruct, enclosure had six, six saltwater tanks and one freshwater tank, all at various temperatures. Together, the pools held 1,685,000 gallons of seawater and could be filled or emptied in one hour by the high or low tides. There were 20,000 bathing suits uh, and 40,000 towels for rent, as well as slides, trapezes, springboards, and high dives for up to 1,600 bathers. And here is Sutro and his wife on the promenade in Sutro Das, and he did engineer that. So during all of this, uh, work uh, and buying real estate and, and building the baths and starting Arbor Day, uh, he was collecting, actively collecting books and collections for his library. One of, I think, his most inspired projects and one of his most passionate. So in the late 1870s, he started buying books and traveling the world and amassing this collection of anywhere from 300,000 to 500,000 rare books, including 4,000 in Cannabula, which are the first printed books. And according to the accounts of the time, was the seventh largest in the world. Um, and they called him the California Bookman in London because he was always around. Um, he would pick up entire lots sometime. Um, there was, talks about his library. And this is an article saying that they'll be stacked seven stories high. And they had a plan for the main floor of the library as well as a plan of the basement. But what happened was that Sutro ran for mayor. And this really derailed him building a building because he ran in 1894. And this is an article that is basically the first time that Sudo says to the public that he's going to be running and it's gonna be against the railroad interests. So he, um, he, he's, he wanted people to be able to afford to come out to the Cliff House and to the Bass and he wanted the railroad to give 
a, uh, a free transfer, which we have today. Um, and they didn't want to do it. And there were other reasons, but so Sutro decided he's going to run for mayor. Um, some of the railroad interests weren't happy with this. And actually, um, Huntington had his nephew hire a detective to try to uncover dirt to discredit Sutro. But apparently he wasted his money. Huntington called Sutro a pestiferous cuss and an as incorruptible a man, I think, as there is on the West Coast. So Sutro became mayor in 1895, and his two-year term as the first Jewish mayor of a major American city was an ambitious one, but not very successful, as he himself was to admit. He did support women's suffrage and opposed the Southern Pacific, but the charter gave mayor little power at the time, and the Board of Supervisors did not really want to work with Sutro. So Sutro never uh, built the building. He died in 1898. And this is the, the full spread in the San Francisco call on the Sunday after his death in 1898. And it's a nice illustration of not only his life and his contributions to the city, but I think it also shows you this was an important person in the city and in the early days of San Francisco. So in 1898, as I said, the, the family disputed for many years. They didn't donate this collection and to the state of California until 1913. In the meantime, it was held in two locations, the Montgomery Block and the um, one on Battery Street. And as I mentioned before, the, the, 2000, or the 1906 earthquake and the fire destroyed two thirds of it probably. But there was, there's still so much left. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the collection. So Sutro didn't wanna copy what Bancroft was doing. And so his collection, Bancroft was collecting Western history and Pacific Northwest history. So Sutro, he decided he was gonna collect according to the German university model. The core tenet was that a student should learn more than the vocation that they're going to be doing, but they should be a world citizen. So they should know a little bit about many subjects. So the works in this collection do cover almost every subject and in so many languages. And as that article previously said, there's, there's just so much, science and engineering, religion, natural history, philosophy, British history, Mexican history, theater. So when Sutro realized the magnitude of the task of building a research collection, he hired German and British experts to go to auctions and to make acquisitions for him as well. So uh, now I'm going to go over just some of the amazing things that are at the Sutro. Um, there are many scholars who know about Shakespeare do know of us because we have what's called the first folio. This was printed in 1623 and it's the first published collection of Shakespeare's plays and it was produced seven years after his death. And it contains 36 of his plays. And it has been said that it's one of the most valuable material and cultural properties ever printed. Um, John Hemminge and Henry Condell, his fellow actors and partners and peers in the Shakespeare Company or in the theater company published this to protect Shakespeare's work from unauthorized bootleg copies, which there were, and they were bad. And they wanted to share the genius of Shakespeare. And this shows you that Shakespeare was also very popular in his own time because this would have been an incredibly expensive thing to do. And folio simply refers to the size of the book. So if they hadn't have done this and spent the seven years making sure that they were editing the best representation of his plays, um, we might not have Macbeth or Julius Caesar or The Tempest. Um, and there are only currently about 235 known to exist of the first folios. Uh, we actually have a second copy in parts, and we have the second, third, and fourth printings of, of this collection. We also have works um, that are sort of just interesting historical pieces. This Psalter uh, was the personal Psalter of Charles II that supposedly he had uh, in his hands upon his coronation. And here is the beautiful clasp. 
Uh, I said that we had in Cannabula, and this is our um, Thomas Aquinas uh, 1478 copy that Sutro purchased from the Royal State Library. It was a duplicate. And um, you can see this, this uh, illuminated initial is left over from manuscript um, when these hand illuminations were part of the work. Um, when printing came in, these illuminated uh, initials and things started to be for the most wealthy and soon just hardly happened at all. But um, you can see like this is real gold leaf and this is all printed and then this is hand done. Uh, this is actually a CODIS, a handwritten bound manuscript on vellum and it's a book of hours. So all of this is hand done and handwritten. Um, we have a huge Hebraica collection, which has a super interesting story. So the Hebraica collection we have is around 170 books and scrolls, like you see here, um, that are Yemenite in origin and are from the 1200s up through the 1800s. Um, uh, an antiquities dealer named Moses Shapira was collecting these kinds of things and selling them. And what happened was in 1883, Shapira, um, he was going to try to sell what he said was the oldest copy of the Bible in the world. Um, and there were actually fragments. And he approached the B British Museum to sell it. But before the museum would pay the one million, and this at the time would have been a lot of money today, um, Shapira's nemesis, the French archaeologist, Charles Clermont Geno denounced the manuscripts and turned the public against Shapira. Distraught and humiliated, Shapira actually committed suicide and Sutro purchased what was in this estate for the store. So it just so happens that um, uh, this author, Hanan Tige, a journalist and a son of a renowned biblical scholar began teaching at SFSU while working on this book already in search for the fragments that Shapira was trying to sell. And he wanted to see if they were indeed fake. He actually used the Sutro collection to determine this after traveling the world in search of answers. Uh, it was right in his backyard and he was able to finish this book with the answer. So if anyone's interested, I just thought I'd put the book up there. Um, one of our other major collections is um, the Banks collection. So Sir Joseph Banks um, was uh, 1743 to 1829, he died. He was um, a part of this age of discovery in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And he was part of this network of, of connections in the British am empire of science and trade and exploration. And he was helping to organize these expeditions. And he was also, he was a huge natural um, history person himself. And he went on the first circumnavigation of the globe with uh, Captain Cook and brought back a thousand new plant species. And him and Captain Cook were stars after that trip. So the collection has a, a ton of interesting things. So Sutro also uh, was involved in uh, the, Trip of the Bounty, which was sent in 1787 on a mission to collect and transport breadfruit plant, plants from Tahiti to the West Indies. Um, this was to be a, a, a form of, of feeding slaves, unfortunately. Um, so they had a five month layover in Tahiti and wouldn't you know it, the men who lived ashore formed relationships with some of the Tahitians and did not want to leave. And this was part of the trouble and part of the mutiny on the bounty. We happen to have a hand uh, sketch, a hand drawn sketch by Bly's own hand of where they were going to store the, the breadfruits. One of the other interesting parts of the Cochin, uh, of the Banks collection is there is a whole series of things on cochineal, which was uh, an insect that created a, a vibrant red color. And this book is a great popular history if anyone was interested in knowing more about it. But basically, when the Spanish um, invaded the New World, um, they were 
shocked at these marketplaces with this vibrant red color that no one had been able to do in Europe. And they were like, how is this happening? And they figured out that it was this tiny insect that lived on cactus called the cochineal that um, the Aztecs had actually domesticated. So for hundreds of years, no one except Spain really knew that it was an insect that was the, the producer of this vibrant color. And um, later on, this is sort of like some uh, industrial espionage banks and other countries, England, banks was working with England to try to sneak out this, this this insect and plant. And so that's why we have swatches with the color. They were experimenting on different ways to plant it and what temperatures. Um, and this is the cactus plant that they live on. Um, so yeah, if anyone's interested, that's just one of the many things. The Banks collection is about 10,000 documents. Um, we also have some amazing natural history books. Um, not only are they beautiful to look at, but they, were, they give scientific information on species. We have uh, several collections um, that are Asian. Um, these hand-painted leaves are really interesting. Um, they are from the Bodhi tree. And in Buddhism, the tree, the Buddha receives enlightenment under. So Buddhists from all over the world make a pilgr pilgrimage to this tree that's supposed to be the ancestral tree. And um, these would be sacred, um, sacred artifacts that they would souvenirs, sacred souvenirs from their pilgrimage. So we have um, two of those and they're really amazing. Um, we have a lot of um, scrolls, um, ukiyo-e, which are Japanese block prints, including hokusai. We have hundreds of those. And we also have this amazing collection by a photographer, Felice Beto, who was one of the first uh, war photographers. He photographed the Crimea. Um, but also he uh, was one of the first to introduce portrait studio photography to Japan because he traveled around with the military and he actually photographed the um, second opium wars and all kinds of things. He was able under diplomatic, for diplomatic reasons to settle in Japan when it was still rigidly curtailed because for many years, uh, Japan, you couldn't leave as a citizen of Japan unless upon death. And that was during the Edo period. Um, it was very culturally inclusive and did not like outsiders. So, so Beto, we have this 10 volume set. This is just one of the many amazing images. Um, you can see it's staged, but it is trying to capture a moment in Japan that's probably fleeting. Um, he's considered the father of Yokihama photography. And, um, he had a thriving practice. He was in Japan for 30 years. And he had he would take these photographs and make these albums for Westerners as souvenirs, but also as Westerners were really fascinated with Japan and they wanted to know more about Japan and its customs and clothing. Um, so that, that was something that he did and he hand colored a lot of these photographs as well. Uh, one of the other things that Sutro collected uh, was the Badiana Bookstore. Um, so we have a huge Mexicana collection because of this. This was the oldest bookstore in Mexico City. It was the principal publishing house. And so it documented, it documents many years of printing history in Mexico. Um, but it also gave us, for instance, 30,000 pamphlets and broadsides. Um, that go over the many revolutions um, in Mexico's history and in its quest to become a republic. And so if anyone's interested in that, um, it's pretty amazing. I can give you more information um, later if you need that. Um, also as part of this Abaniana bookstore was um, uh, the Calejo, Sotatoloco de Santa Cruz, Calejos. So these were um, convents that were um, that ha were the first that Spanish brought over in the New World. And these firebrands uh, will show where these books have been. And they were in these different colleges. Um, the first, which were established to uh, educate the elite Aztec youth with probably the, the idea that they would eventually become ordained priests. Um, 
And so we have this library with these firebrands and it's, um, it's called our Tolato Loco uh, collection, if anyone's interested. Uh, we also have, obviously laws are important. And so this is the first law book printed in, in near Mexico City in the New World. Um, and it's the 16th book printed in the New World. Um, this is a really interesting collection. It is, these are um, original proofs uh, from Lord King, Kingsborough's Antiquities of Mexico. So Kingsborough was this Irish antiquarian who thought to prove that the indigenous peoples of the Americas were a lost tribe of Israel. So he uh, wanted to make facsimiles of all of these codices and documents and hired a painter to do this. And so we have all of these codices that were painted, um, including what's called the Dresden Codex, which is um, the oldest handwritten book in the New World. Um, but so the exorbitant cost of his doing this endeavor cost him almost all of his fortune and landed him in debtor's prison where he died. But um, we still have these gorgeous uh, prints of codices that otherwise would have been lost or are hidden in various archives like the Vatican in Western Europe or were destroyed by the Spanish. So uh, Sutro finally, um, the Sutro family finally decides to honor their father's wish that San Francisco would have this public research library. And so they donated the, the collection to the state of California with the stipulation that it never leave the city limits of San Francisco. And so that's, as I said, kind of why we have sort of been obscured and some people even thought the whole library burned up in the 1906 earthquake, but no, we're actually one of the only libraries to survive that earthquake. Um, so we were located at the Lane Medical Library in, in San Francisco for the first early years. Uh, then we were in San Francisco Public Library, banished to the basement and leaks and all kinds of horrors that make me shudder. And this is the reading room at the public library. Uh, this is, a, a, I guess, a Mexican diplomat looking at some of the collections. Um, we were briefly at USF. And these are some articles. There was a little bit of a protest because USF is a religious institution, but Sutro needed at home and it needed to stay with the state of California. So uh, luckily it did. And then uh, the home that we had before our final, res our final residence was at Winston, which a lot of our genealogists remember quite fondly because we had a lot of free parking and it was good parking. However, we are in this beautiful new building on the campus of San Francisco State University. There's a joint, we're a joint library. So it's the J. Paul Leonard Library, Sutro Library. Um, a bond measure was passed that allowed them to retrofit their old library at San Francisco State. And we were a part of the deal. So we are now co-residents and our reading room is on the fifth floor. This is the bottom floor. It's, a gorgeous building and there's a lot of trees and plants. Um, this is a view. And if you come to the library, this is where you'll sign in. And because we have rare items, um, we ask that people put all of their belongings away except for electronic devices, pencils, and single sheets of paper. Uh, this is part of our reading room where our genealogy and family history collections are located. Uh, these are our Part of our vault collections, which if you were to look at that, we would actually page and bring down um, to the fifth floor for you to look at. Um, so if you have any interest in using our sources or you have any questions about the library, this is our homepage. And if you just uh, clicked on Ask a Librarian, it just it brings you to an online form that's really easy to fill out. And then you can ask us whenever questions that you have. Um, and so that is the end of my, oh, uh, FI, the, the Sutro finally opened up in the new location in 2012, and um, we've been 
greatly and it's greatly enhanced our usage with for the special collections because we have students coming in and it and just amazed at this treasure that they're allowed to use and touch um, and primary sources as was said at the beginning of this are great ways to bring history to life and to motivate students to think critically about the past and about the present. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. If you have any questions, um, that's the end of my presentation. Great, thank you, Diana. Um, the slides were terrific. And um, as I said to you yes, the other day when we, were, when we were talking and I saw some of the slides, uh, your description of Arbor Day is, is dead on. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, charming description and we need to bring that back. Uh, probably what we don't need to bring back is renting bathing suits. Uh, <laughs> so we do Great. have some questions uh, and I think I set us up for this one when I mentioned the tower. Where does the name for the Sutro Tower come from and why is it there? So the name, it, it's, it's because um, that land was donated by Sutro to um, not only the medical school at UCSF, but the city. So there's Sutro Forest. So it's more of a legacy of him giving that land to the public for public use. Um, okay. So that's, yeah, that's why. All right. And then two related to the tunnel itself. Um, can you still see it in Virginia yes. City? Yeah, I privately thought I remembered owned. that too. I've been there. It's privately owned, but it's still there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then why did B of A want to torpedo that project as much as they did? So if Sutra had gotten that tunnel um, done in time for like when they were still making, a, when they were still getting a lot of ore, um, they, he could have rented um, this tunnel out to all of those mining interests. And so Ralston was, he didn't want that to be the case. Like, I think he was interested in making money himself off of something like that and didn't want him to, didn't want to pay rent. Okay. Um, the other question that we have, given the fact that uh, the building I am in just closed a couple days ago because of restrictions from COVID. Are you guys currently open? We are not open. Um, we we can do some reference, um, but yeah, we're closed until further notice because we're at San Francisco State. So it's pretty locked down right now. Okay, and then you mentioned the genealogy aspect. Um, can you describe some of the genealog genealogical holdings uh, and then there's a question of, do you, can, do you have German sources? And what about um, uh, California genealogy? So let me take care of the California genealogy first. So because, just because of the nature of the institution, so we're part of the California State Library, there's a California history room in Sacramento and they have the primary genealogy resources for California. We have some duplicates, so we do have some. It's just not our specialty. So we have the 49 states other than California that we specialize. Um, there are there are series of books like um, there's a whole series of books, Mayflower Descendants that we have. There are over I want to say there are like around 8,000 or more family histories. Some are original that don't exist anywhere else and. So those would be like people that did their own genealogy for years and years and wanted it to go somewhere. And so they've given it to us and it's just part of now our collection. So um, those are a pretty re rich resource. They're pretty much arranged in last name order. Um, we have a series of books, Italian to America, Irish to America, Germans to America, which are passenger lists. So we have tons of passenger lists. Um, we have a series of books that are Louisiana Parish records, which are pretty amazing. We have the only complete set in the Bay Area. I'm not a geneal genealogy librarian, so I don't know, I can't remember that they're like, hey, Bear is the author of the genealogy. Um, so, so we have that, we have um, like in, in each state, there are Pope directories and like land records and, um, you know, probate records. So 
you know, any kind of record that you could think of to trace an ancestor. We, we have those and they're usually by state. Okay. Uh, actually, we've got a couple more questions that came in. So if I can keep you around a little longer. Um, do you give private tours? Do you give tours to private groups? I guess is the question. We can uh, actually, and we, you can go to our website and book a tour um, when we're open. Absolutely. And then you would just tell us what your major interests were, because oftentimes we will pull items from our vault and then bring them down and and give the tour that way as well. Okay. Um, a lot of people are just saying they love the presentation. I wanted to throw that into you now. Thanks, thanks. Uh, so yeah, so kudos for that. Thank um, you. Okay, so uh, in the future, oh, wait a minute, excuse me. We've already covered that, okay? Um, everybody in the world is digitizing. Yep. You too? Uh, we have a lot of digital things. Um, and in fact, we uh, we don't have exhibits up on Google Arts and Culture yet, but we have, uh, along with other institutions, partnered with Google Arts and Culture to provide high quality images and exhibits so that people can get them there. But in our own catalog, um, you can just go to our catalog and choose picture catalog. I, we could You could actually put in a reference request, but. It just is, is we have thousands and thousands of images that we've digitized that are online. A lot of them are images, but some of them are primary documents. And, um, you know, we choose which ones are probably the most likely that people want to look at and relevant. So that's sort of how we plan our digitization. Um, and then also when I am, we do exhibits, we have, we have digitized images up for that. We have, um, an Omeka site. So if you want, if you just like typed in Sutra Library Omeka, O-M-E-K-A, we have digitized images and, and digital exhibits up there, including the Women's March um, and some industrial revolution. There's an industrial revolution exhibit. There's actually a pretty like extensive um, collection of those Japanese photos by Solis Beto. So yeah. Um, uh, there we do and you can follow us on instagram we have a lot of great images up there too okay and this this next one is more of a comment but it refers to that nomadic uh, lifestyle that the library had um this person uh dave says i wish the suit to the library was at sf state when i was there in the 70s um but he, then he adds the comment about carson city virginia city being such great places to visit and um how the tunnel was uh, important, certainly, to the Virginia City uh, Comstock load work. And what he says was, and I'll leave this out as just a comment, a good place on a Saturday night. So I don't know what that one's about. Really but yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's a really fun place. <laughs> and I think that's it. So okay. thank you for the presentation thank um, you. and bringing the Sutro Library to us. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for viewing this morning. And if you missed any of this program uh, or like to view it again, it'll be up uh, early next week on our website, museumsrv.org. And you can see our earlier programs there as well. Our next program will be on Thursday, December the 17th at 1130. Henry Baum, president of the Pacific Railroad or Pacific Locomotive Association will tell the story of the Niles Canyon Rail Line and its connection to the Transcontinental Railroad. He will also talk about the rail line that ran through the valley and right past the building that I'm sitting in at the moment. Um, if you like these programs and want them to continue, we ask that you make a donation to the museum's homepage, museumsrv.org, and click on the Donate Now button. I also need to say that the museum's in need of volunteers. So if you have some time, please let us know. Uh, we would like to hear from you. I would like to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Stay safe and thank you for watching.